Test, 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 test. Should I just go to a regular, should I just go to a regular mic and we'll, we'll figure this out later? Okay, so I'm guessing we're gonna have a lot of technical difficulties today. <laughs> I, can, I can already tell. All right, we'll see. All right, before we start, can we stand up and pray? <clears throat> in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because you are such a good God, Lord, a great God, a God who's provided so much for us, Lord. And Lord, uh, including this church that we may come and we can c come gather here is the body of Christ, Lord. So Lord, I, I thank you for the, the liturgy we just celebrated, Lord, but I know that You've given all for us, Lord, and, and we need to give for you. So, Lord, I know that there's, there's things that you want to speak into our lives. There's things, there's a message that you want to give each one of us today, Lord. I ask that, that you just kind of clear our heart, Lord, clear all of our distractions, Lord, and just let us be attentive to, the, to your voice, Lord. Not my voice even, Lord, but your voice, because I know that there's things in our life that, that you kind of want to fine-tune a little bit. So, Lord, I ask that that your presence fill this room right now, Lord, and that you be with us right now in our talk, and that it be your talk, that you will uncover things in our life, Lord, that you will, you will point us in the direction of things in our life. Because ultimately, Lord, that's, we want to be closer to you. We want this year to be different than all of the prior years. We want this year to be a year of growth. So, Lord, I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord, that you may be glorified, that you may be exalted, Lord, so that you can have a people unto yourself. And I ask that you allow us to be that people. And I ask that the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, they took, O St. Mary, all the saints in my chairs, here we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for the kingdom of power. All right, guys. So I want to thank you guys for coming back to the adult meeting. Um, I just want just to, to start off by saying I hope 2020 is starting well for everybody. I hope everyone's having a good year so far. Um, it seems like, you know, it seems like January is actually almost over when you think about it. Um, this will be, this is the last Sunday in January. So you, <laughs> roughly 10 percent of the year is already gone. If you really kind of think about that and you, <laughs> things are just running. Right. Um, and if you guys remember, can anyone say for like the last couple weeks that we've been up here, um, the first week I touched on it just a little bit. I know Mark kind of really kind of dove in on it last week. Does anyone know that what we're actually talking about right now? 2020 vision. Thank you, Michelle. I can always count on Michelle. All right. Um, it's, and, and, and honestly, I love this concept of vision, right? Like, and the whole benefit of vision is seeing what's coming, right? Like seeing what's kind of ahead. And vision is, it's imperative. And if you ever, <laughs> if you've ever woken up in the middle of the night and your eyes haven't adjusted yet and you're walking around in the dark and you kick something that's, you know, like a corner of a bed that you thought was a little bit further away or maybe a couch and it, and it just hurts and you start realizing that like, you know, walking through life without vision, a lot of times it's painful, right? And you don't even realize, you might think that you're okay until you do something that kind of really, really hurts. And when we were thinking about this, this concept of vision for the series, we were thinking about this, this thought, and we were kind of building off of it. It's, what are things going to look like in five to ten years from now? You know, five to ten years is a short enough period where we all kind of would, we, we have an idea of where we want to be in the next five to ten years. So even for Holy Transfiguration Church, right, and we talk about Holy Transfiguration Church a lot, we love the fact that we were named after the Holy Transfiguration because it's God's plan for every single one of us in this church, that when we walk into this church, we leave transfigured, right? There should be a change that's occurring in every single one of our lives. So as a church, what should we be looking like in the next five to ten years? If we were just going to take a snapshot, 2030, what is this church going to look like? Okay, well, let me ask you this, right? Maybe the church is a little bit too far out for you, 
right? Like you don't know what this church is going to look like. We don't know what the priests are going to be implementing. We don't know what's happening with our building project. We don't know any of that other stuff. Well, let me ask you this. Five to 10 years from now, what do you want your family to look like? You know, that's a convicting thought. I, I thought about that. And right now I have four young kids, you know, 12, 10, 9, and 4. In 10 years from now, my 12-year-old is going to be 22. Is that going to look a little bit different? What do I want my family to look like in 10 years? Do I want us to be close? Do I want us to still enjoy family time? Do I want us to hang out as a family unit? Right? Five years from now. Okay, well, let me ask you this. How about your marriage? What do you want your marriage to look like in the next five to 10 years? Because I'm sorry to break it to you, but the natural drift of marriage is isolation. And unless you're being very, very intentional, you might actually be seeing signs of that in your marriage right now. You just say, you know what? We're not as close as we used to be. Life is busy. Life is hard. Each one of us is kind of going in our own little direction, right? Well, what's your marriage going to look like in five to 10 years? Because chances are, if you do not go and actually you're purposeful against that natural drift of isolation, then in five to 10 years, I don't know what your marriage is going to look like. I don't know what, my, I don't know what mine's going to look like. But what I want to talk about today is who do you want to be in five to 10 years from now? Like, what do you want your life to look like? So, and it's funny because, you know, we do this re redundant activity every year about this time at work, right? So at work, I manage a team of commercial bankers. Um, and this time of the year, we're always putting together our business plans. Because you see, I manage a team. It's a sales organization. So we all have goals, okay? Uh, unfortunately, everyone top down, every, everyone's got you know, a loan production goal, they've got a deposit production goal, they've got a relationship growth goal, everything that you can think of, right? So they've got to grow their book of business, they've got to bring on these new loans and these new deposit relationships, and they have to plan out their activities because what we want is we want to know, hey, how am I going to get there, right? If I have all of these goals, I need to know what activities am I going to do to get there because do you know what they call a goal without a plan? Has anyone? It's a famous quote. A goal without a plan it's just a dream. A goal without a plan is just a dream. Now, it's great because at work, it's very quantitative. It's very, very easy, right? Because I can measure it. I can calculate it. I can look at your loan portfolio. I can tell you that this is where you started the year. This is where you ended the year. You either grew or you shrunk, right? Um, I can calculate your, your outstanding loan to balance relationships. So it's super easy. With a matter of a click, I have all the forms that I need and all the reports generated to know whether or not there's growth. Now, the challenge to that on the other side is spiritual. Spiritual, it's a different game. It's a completely different game. So how do we measure our spiritual lives? You know, every year we close out a year, and I can almost guarantee that every single one of us at the end of 2019, we started thinking, you know what, next year I just want, I want grow. I want to grow spiritually. I want to be more deep. I want to be this. I want to be that, right? And I guarantee you, no matter where you are in your spiritual life, at the end of this year, we're all going to have the same goal that we say, oh, man, 2021, I want to grow and I want to be more spiritual and I have a deeper understanding of Christ and a deeper relationship with him, right? Now, we all have these goals, but do we put together a plan to grow these goals, because I'll be honest with you, I, I, I look at my team at work and I say, if these guys got a plan to hit some stupid goal that we have at work that really doesn't matter, how are we functioning without a plan to hit our spiritual goals? Because those are the things that really, really do matter. So let me start by asking you this. And this is personal. Who do you want to be in 10 years? What do you want to look like? And I'm going to be honest, I'm going to have a lot of questions for you guys, and this is stuff that I really want you guys to really, you know, you're probably not going to be able to jot up those answers right now, but if you have either a paper and pencil, if you've got a cell phone, if you've got anything like that, jot some of this stuff down, because I will tell you, only 10% of what needs to happen today is going to happen up here in the next 20, 25 minutes. The other 90% is going to be what you do with it. And I really pray and I hope that we do something with it this week because this stuff, in my opinion, this is probably some of the most important stuff that we can actually do. But who do you want to be in 10 years? What personality traits would you like to have? Would you like to possess? How would you like to be described by people around you? 
And it's funny because I think a lot of the times if I ask somebody, and this is when, I, when I'm interviewing people and I say, where do you want to be in the, in the next five to 10 years at work? Everyone's got a plan. I want to hold this position. I want to be making this much money. This is my growth trajectory. This is my professional goals. You know, I want to go get an MBA. And everyone knows exactly where they want to be. But if I asked you spiritually, where do you want to be in the next five, 10 years? They say, I just want to be better. Well, that's not very tangible. It's not very quantitative. And, and I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't think it's a good answer. See, because <clears throat> I think about that question a lot. And when I start thinking about what do, who do I want to be in the next 10 years, the first thing I start thinking about is I think a lot of my spiritual mentors. Right? And I look at people in my life and I said, man, I wish I had the patience that I see in this spiritual mentor. Man, I wish I was a man of prayer the way that I see so-and-so is a man of prayer. You know, and I have all of these different aspects of my life where I said, I want to, I want to be like them more. Right? When I read through the, like, the scripture and I see a story where Christ shows a characteristic that's just so beautiful, like his mercy and his grace, and I said, I want to have that mercy and grace. You know, I, I sit there and I think of the next 10 years from now, I don't want to have to Google whatever Bible verse I'm looking for. I want to have it memorized. You know, I want to be a man of prayer. I want to do a better job loving and serving others. Right? I, I'm telling you, in 10 years from now, if, if they said, hey, what do you know about Peter? You mean, oh, you mean that one guy, Peter? The guy who points others to Christ, and he points them to Christ, and then he gets them to know him more deeply? Like, that's, that's, that's how I want to be in 10 years. You know, but then I look at my life, and I realize that I've, I've actually got no plan to get there, and that's a fail. You know, we have so much ambition in so many different areas of our life, so many different aspects. But when, our, when it comes to our spiritual life, what do we do? We totally shoot from the hip. So what's your plan for spiritual growth? I go to church on Sunday mornings. How's that working for us? Personally, I'm leaving some on the table. We don't set goals. We don't commit to activities. And at the end of every year, we just decide that we're going to try a little bit harder. But I'm going to tell you, my goal, I know Mark's goal, the priest's goal, 2020 is going to be different, guys. Let this year be different. You know, we're going to discuss so many things. We're going to discuss so many aspects of your life in the next few weeks. I'm going to tell you guys something, that it all starts here. And I'm not even saying it all starts here in this series. I'm telling you it all starts here in this talk. Okay? And why I believe that it all starts here in this talk is because change starts right here. Change doesn't start. I'm not, it doesn't start with changing my family. It doesn't start with changing my marriage. It doesn't start with changing my church. Do you know where change starts? It starts with changing me most important thing you can do is just make a change to me because we will not be effective in changing any aspect of our life if we cannot effectively change ourselves with the help and the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want to give everyone, I want to give you guys five steps to planning. Okay, this is a little bit more of the managerial side of me, right? But this is five steps to planning that can make 2020, the, the year of vision, completely different for you. Okay, and I will tell you that this is not something that doesn't take work. But you know what? There is nothing in life that is easy that is worth it. Anything that you've achieved in your life that was worth having took work. And it's always worth it on the other side. It will not happen on accident, but I believe that it will require us to have intentionality, purpose, drive, commitment. And then once we imp implement all of those things, we're going to be great. We're going to be in the right direction. And 2020 could be that year for you. So the first step, if you're writing this down, and if you're not writing this down, this is the first step, write it down. Um, file, find your ground zero. Find your ground zero. You know, it's funny. So again, at work, January, you know, well, January 1st is a holiday, but January 2nd, all of our reports go back to zero. Doesn't matter how well you did last year. Didn't matter if you were the top guy. I'll be honest with you, it didn't even matter if you were the last guy. January 2nd, everything resets to zero because you have to know where you start. I'm going to tell you spiritually, it's the same way. We have to know where we're, gonna, where we're starting. and we, If we're setting goals, you have to know where you currently stand. And Romans 12, 3 says, For I say to you, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly 
as God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. So what, what that's basically saying is be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Okay? Um, it's hard to self-evaluate. And I'll be the first one to tell you that because guess what? Peter, in my life, I'm very quick to think that I deserve mercy and others deserve judgment. Right? Like if I ever do anything wrong in my life, they're like, Peter, did you do that? Well, yeah, I did that. But the reason is, right? With someone else, I, I'll, I'm quick to just jump all over them and to judge them and to say, I can't believe that they did this and I can't believe that they did that. Right? It is hard to self-evaluate. And I will tell you that there's a part of us that we err on one of two sides, right? Sometimes we ignore the things in our life that we need to address. Areas of sin, areas of things where, you know, where we're showing weakness and defeat, and we, we will make excuses for ourselves there, right? And I think we all know exactly what that looks like. But I'm going to tell you that there's another side of it too. And there's a lot of times that we're over negative, And we're very, very hard on ourselves, harder on ourselves. And you see, and personally, I see this a lot when you're dealing with young children and they made a mistake and they feel bad and they, and they, and they confessed it. And you see that there's a sincere repentance and you tell them it's okay. It's okay. God will forgive you. And the problem is not God's not willing to forgive them. The problem is that they're not willing to forgive themselves. And we get overly negative on that side. So it's, it's this delicate balance, right? Personally, in my life, I wish I was that guy. I'm more on the other side where I will sweep my stuff under the rug and I will basically hide it. And it's funny because in Matthew 7, it's a perfect example when Christ basically says that, you know, you're sitting here, you're te- taking a speck out of your brother's eye when you have a whole log in, in our own eye. So if I had to say that we err on one side or the other, I think it's the same exact side that Christ is calling us out on. And the fact that we need to be brutally honest with ourselves on where we, where we stand. <coughs> so here's a couple of questions that I like to kind of, que- like I, I like to answer myself to see how I'm doing, right? And this is good questions for you to kind of reevaluate your 2019 so we see exactly where we're starting in 2020, okay? It's kind of, I, I call it like the five buckets, right? The first bucket, how's my walk with God? It's kind of a general bucket right? This is just how do you feel it's going? Am I sitting with him? Am I reading in my Bible regularly? Am I praying regularly? How much effort am I actually putting into my relationship with Christ? I'll tell you, that's, it's a convicting question when you look at it that way. Because a lot of the times we think that, oh, I, sh- I show up to church every Sunday. You know, I'll even do this. I'll even do that. You know, I tithe a little bit. But how much effort do we actually spend in getting to know him? effort. So the second bucket, sins in my life. The sins in my life is a great gauge because guess what happens? Whenever we ask that question, there's always two things that kind of comes to mind, right? A, are there, area, any, are there any areas of my life where I'm experiencing victory? Things that were like, you know, things that were, were, had power over me. Temptations that I was not successful in overcoming. But now by the grace of God and by drawing closer to him, I have victory of, of those sins. And those are sins of the past. And they're washed away and they do not happen anymore. Okay? Now on the other side, is there areas of my life where I allow sin to just stay there? And I say that, you know what, like 90% of my life, I say, no, this is not allowed. But there's this 10% where you say that, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep these. I'm just going to let them hang out. I'm comfortable. I'm going to keep an eye on them to make sure that they don't grow. Okay, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave them for a while. Very dangerous. That's very dangerous. One of my favorite Bible verses is, Satan walks around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And you know how he does that? With these little sins that he leaves in there, just saying, hey, just, you know, it's not a big deal. Just leave it here. You know, just keep an eye on it. It's not going to grow. Well, that's Satan's voice because he knows he has plans for that sin, and he, he wants to devour you with it right? The third bucket. What do my friendships look like? Look back at your 2019, right? There's this great, uh, great book that came out. Um, I, I forget what it's called, but the whole, it's a proximity uh, principle. And it's basically saying that you are the average of your five closest friends. 
you are the average of your five closest friends, which would be great if you hung out with great people. But if you hang out with people who you look at them, you say, "Ah, that guy's a little, ah." well, birds of the same feather flock together, right? And that's a great way because guess what? If we were living these these really consecrated lives where we were set apart and we, we were pursuing God and we were running after him and we just wanted him, then we wouldn't have a tolerance to hang around with other people that might have a different feeling about those things. The fourth one, your marriage. Now, that's not the state of your marriage because I know that that's, that's a whole other thing. What I'm telling you is, are you doing what you need to do in your marriage? Are you receptive? Are you being the spouse that Christ is calling you to be in your marriage? irregardless of what the other side is doing. Like, am I being faithful to my calling? And then the fifth bucket is doing good. Do I go out of my way to do good works? Do I look for opportunities where I can serve and I can bless others? And if so, how consistently? So once you actually look at those five buckets, that's your ground zero. Because in each one of those buckets, In the coming year, you want to do better and better and better. Because once you identify that, you can know where we need to start building. All right, the second step is we need to start setting positive goals. Positive goals. And I know that, you know, obviously, so I was reading a little about goal setting, all of this other stuff, because, you know, I I was preparing. and this was a great opportunity because I'm double dipping everything I'm using here. I'm also going to use it at work. So, <laughs> so it's total, total double dipping. But um, it could be a challenge sometimes because sometimes when we set goals, we set goals that sound something like I'm not going to be selfish and I'm not going to get mad anymore. I'm not going to yell at my kids. Right? Like that's kind of like what our goal setting sounds like. And, um, and I'll be honest with you, that's not a positive goal. By any means. As a matter of fact, if that is your goal, you will turn your experience into something where habitually you will just feel like I am falling short again and again and again. So why don't we just kind of switch it up a little? Because I don't think any of us need to be reminded of our shortcomings, right? Like that's that's not positive goal setting. Why don't we say something like, you know what? I want to be calm and loving. I want to be patient. I want to be compassionate. See how that goal is a little bit more motivating, right? That goal right there, when you say that this is what I want to achieve, it, it encourages you, right? And not only that, when the opportunity arises, and you know what? There could be an opportunity to get mad, right? But instead of saying, I'm not going to get mad, because chances are you are mad, what you're actually going to tell yourself is that, you know what? This is an opportunity for compassion, right? This is an opportunity to, for patience, and it keeps us working towards a good goal, a positive goal, right? And I love it um, because that's something that I can get behind. And I love because St. Paul here in Philippians 4, he basically says, uh, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, and if there's any virtue, and if anything at all is praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So what's St. Paul doing? St. Paul's actually doing the same exact thing. He's basically setting some positive goals. He says, do all the positive things. Focus your time on the positive things. Figure out what qualities you would love to achieve in the coming year and write them down. And I think this is huge because, you know, don't worry about what you don't want to be. We're going to have enough time (laughs) trying to overcome all of that stuff, right? Don't don't lose yourself. Focus on what you don't want to be. Focus on what you do want to be. You know, focus on, like, for me, I'm like, what does Peter want to be in five to ten years? And I need to start putting that, I need to start building that stuff right now. Because guess what? If I say, I want Peter to be a man of prayer in five to ten years, what's my plan going to include? Prayer. Only way I'm going to become a man of prayer. Say, I want to get to know my Bible more. In five to ten years, I want somebody to be like, oh, Peter, this topic, I'm going to be like, oh, you're going to find that right here. This is your go-to text. Only way I'm going to get to be that guy is if I put a plan that involves my Bible now. Figure out what you want to be in five to ten years and start it now. The third thing we need to do is we need to set attainable, an attainable number of goals. 
an attainable number of goals. I will tell you, every year, I haven't done this yet with, uh, we're, we're scheduled to do it the first week of February. But, you know, I kind of give all of my lenders, I say, hey, this is the day I need everyone's business plan, and we'll all get together, kind of talk through them individually. And for no joke, I've got a lender who's been with me for years, and this guy just kills me. Like, every single time, the guy sends me his business plan, um, and he's not a top guy, he's not a bottom guy, he's a very middle-of-the-road guy, um, always hovers right, about, uh, right around goal, sometimes a little bit over, sometimes a little bit under. But I will say this, he doesn't have business plans. This guy's got like dissertations, right? Everyone's business plan, in my opinion, a good business plan, you're probably looking at a page. Bullet pointed, you know, outline form. This guy's sending like three to four pages of like, you know, all of these intricate stuff that he wants to do. He's talking about all of these activities that he's never even been successful in implementing it in the past. But I'm telling you, he walks into my office, he sends me that business plan, and he's just like really, really proud of himself, right? Like, look how good my business plan is. And do you know what I get? I get frustrated. Because you might have the best plan in the world. But if you're not actually going to do it, then it's meaningless. And that's why I tell people, like usually like on my, on my lenders, I say, hey, just try a three-prong approach. Right? Just give me three solid activities that you know that will help you be successful this year. And we'll just kind of stick to that. Because the best business plan that you can ever have and the best spiritual rule that you can ever have is the one that you'll actually do, right? How many times, I can't tell you how many times I'll, I'll be sitting with somebody and um, usually at a retreat or something like that, and I say, hey, what, you know, when we get back from this retreat, what are some of the things that you're going to implement? And they say, I'm going to read the Bible in a year. I said, that's awesome. Are you reading your Bible now? Nope. Like, like not frequently? No, nope, Pete. Like, I don't even know where it is. So you're going to go from here, <laughs> way over here. You know, I think that's uh, reading the Bible in a year is roughly about five chapters a day. And I was just like, you know, you need to kind of slow it down a little bit, right? Figure out what the right goal is for you, right? And then same thing. You talked about, so I want to be a man of prayer. Okay, cool. How, tell me, what's that going to look like for you? Well, I'm just going to read every hour of the Igbeya every day. Really? How much are you praying right now? Well, I'm not. Okay, well, why don't we just kind of slow it down a little bit? <laughs> Take things one step at a time, and let's, do, let's have some attainable goals, right? Um, you want to feel the presence of God? Then we should carve out a little time every day, even if it's only five minutes a day, where you feel the presence of God. You want to see God doing big things? You know, you want to feel that, you know, you're serving. You want to do all this other stuff. Well, you know what that looks like in a business plan? Is when God's telling you to do something, answer yes. Because I will tell you that we have a God who's very, very much willing to use us to do amazing things. But a lot of the times when he kind of nudges us or he pokes us, you know, saying, hey, I need you to do this, each one of us could probably come up with three to five reasons on why we can't. Not today, God, I'm busy. I've got this going on. I've got that going on right? But what we have to do is we've got just to, to set an attainable number of goals. Personally, in my life, I've, that, that magic number is three to five things. Three to five things that you commit to that you will make these three to five things happen. Kind of right in line with this was my fourth one, which was make your goals realistic. Make the goals realistic. You know, it's funny, um, if you go to the gym, Everyone hates the month of January because guess what happens in the month of January? It's crazy crowded, right? And everyone shows up and you have to wait for equipment. But you know the only saving grace in the month of January is that in the month of February, it's going to be empty again. So you just push through, right? <laughs> like if you could just make it to February, all those people stop coming again. Why? Because all of these people who made these New Year's resolutions ended up having these huge goals, right? I'm going to cut out sugar, and I'm going to work out at 5 o'clock in the morning, and then I'm going to spend two hours doing this. I'm going to go back in the PM, and I'm going to run on the elliptical, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do all that. It's just like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work. They went too big, right? And I love this verse in Proverbs 21.5. It says, the plans of the diligent um, lead surely to plenty, but, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. Like you need to have, it's not just enough to have a plan, but you have to have 
a good plan, right? So um, there's this, I forget what they call it, but it's, it's smart, right? When you start talking about like goal planning, they, they came out with this uh, acronym, which is SMART. So my thing is start smart. So Mark will, Mark's got the worksheet, but I'm going to tell you what each one of them stands, uh, stands for. Okay, so you got the S. The S is specific. Okay, if you've got a plan, it's got to be specific. Right? What are you exactly hoping to accomplish? Right? Then you go to the M. The M is measurable. If you have a plan, you have to be able to tell whether or not you're actually doing it. What metric will you use to, deter to determine whether or not you've accomplished the goal? Right? The A, it's got to be attainable. And this is where I think a lot of us, like I've kind of spent a little bit of time on this, this is where a lot of us kind of go astray. Like we have to actually figure out, is this goal achievable? R, it has to be relevant. So if you want to grow spiritually, then let, let the activity or let the, let the plan be spiritual. And then T, time bound. What is a realistic completion of time? If you're not realistic, you probably will not be successful in achieving your goal. And the one that I am a huge fan of is after you actually put that plan together is track it. Track it. So for me, whether it's if you're at the gym and you're writing down what kind of weight you're doing or what exercises you're doing or how much you did that with last set so you can kind of track it to make sure that you're growing, whether if it's in your, in your, uh, your quiet times and you're sitting there and you're tracking, you take a journal and you basically say, this is what I read today, this is what God told me, you know, but you have to kind of track it to make sure that you're doing it. It's a beautiful sense of self-accountability. And I don't know what it is about me, but whenever I write something down, it becomes very, very real to me. And even more so when I write it down and I date it, like if I'm journaling, right, and I write it today, then I don't want to go back to my journal in two days and realize that I didn't write something down yesterday. So tracking it has a lot of value. It, track your progress, um, and it will motivate you to also do it. The fifth bucket, which is like the kind of the, the, the last thing that I would say is, is kind of a game changer and something that I really feel that could make this all the difference, enlist help. And even though it is, in my opinion, the most valuable piece, the most valuable, it is also definitely the hardest. It's the most important, and, and I love this, in Exodus 18, 17, 18, so Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do is not good. Both you and these men who are with you will surely wear yourselves out, for this thing is too much for you and you're not able to perform it by yourself. Moses' father-in-law gave him some very, very good advice because he said some tasks are very, very difficult for one person to do alone. Very, very difficult. If you go to Ecclesiastics, it's the same exact thing where it starts talking about the encouragement of being surrounding yourself with others, right? Because one person alone will get burnt out. And all of us, we also need encouragement. And other times, we're just not going to be in the mood to do it. But knowing that someone else is going to be following up with you will create that accountability to push you to do it, to encourage you to do it. The best way to success is accountability. In the same way, even with my business plans with my lenders. So I go ahead and they all turn in their business plans. We review them. We get on the same page. But you know what I do after that? Every week we do one-on-ones just to kind of track progress. Same thing. It's great if you have a plan, but it's nothing if you don't implement on it. So there's got to be these reoccurring touches to make sure that you are doing everything that you're supposed to be doing and that you are faithfully completing your plan. And there's times where I will, I'll be meeting with my, one of my lenders and I say, did you do any of this stuff last week? And they say, no, we didn't do any. And I say, that's okay, but we need to get back on track. And sometimes we need those friends in our lives that are going to kind of reach out to us and say, hey, man, how have you been? Have you been reading? Have you been in the Word? Have you been praying? Did you attend the church? I didn't see you last Sunday. What's going on? And they say, hey, I, I, I didn't. That's okay. Let's get back on track, right? And I fear a lot of us, we need this. This could be our missing piece. This could be one thing, the big thing that's kind of holding us back to that success we're looking for and growing spiritually. And I recommend that when we have these plans or these goals that we all need to be, be seeking guidance. We need to get with our confession fathers. We need to sit with them because there's a lot of times where we'll be, we'll be looking at something and our confession father should know us and basically say, you know what, I, don't, I, I think we need to tweak this. 
Maybe lower this here a little bit here. Step this up here a little bit here, right? To make sure that all of our plans are appropriate. And I'll tell you that the having the plan and sharing the plan is a great way to practice vulnerability. It teaches us how to show our weakness and our setbacks when we don't hit the mark. Because I will tell you that it's hard sometimes to let people know that, that I'm human and that I'm a sinner and that I do stupid things. But when I have people in my life where I've given them access to that, that it helps me grow as well. And I believe that if we want to be that spiritual person in five to ten years from today, it starts today. It starts now. You know, I used to think when I was in, uh, when I was in college that spirituality was just something that kind of happened when you grew up, right? And I started realizing, okay, well, maybe that's not the case. Because now the white hairs are coming in, but I don't feel like I have any of the spirituality or the wisdom that I thought was going to come with it. But we need to grow in virtues, and we want to know, you know, where does, do you want to know where, I remember someone used to always ask me, say, how do I know I'm in God's will? I said, I don't know how to answer that question. But I'll tell you what, do you want to be in God's will in 10 years from now? And they say, yeah, without a doubt. You want to be married to the right person in 10 years from now? You want to have the right career 10 years from now? You want to have the right everything 10 years from now? And they're like, yeah. And I was like, well, then be in God's will today. And you wake up tomorrow, be in God's will tomorrow. And the day after that, wake up and do your best to be in God's will. And I guess for me, that's, you know, all of these nice words and stuff, but like, that's really what it comes down to is if we want to be who we want to be in 10 years from now, then it starts in the right activities today. So here's my thing. I want you guys literally, like I said, I, I want people to come up with plans. Um, we will not be sitting with you guys to evaluate them. <laughs> I'll save that for my, for my team at work. But I, I'm going to throw out some things that I feel should have a place in your plan. Okay? Whatever it's going to look like, you guys can structure it however you want. But I was, trying, I was thinking of my plan, and it involves all of these things. So I'm going to throw it out to you guys just for food for thought. Right? But every plan, in my opinion, should have Bible reading, should have prayer, should have self-examination. It should have a commitment to a weekly spiritual meeting. It should have a commitment that Sunday mornings, no matter what, we're going to be in the Lord's house. We'll be there early, and we'll be partaking of communion. Our plans, they should, um, they should, obviously, they should have communion, but they should also have confession. And the reason why I'm saying that this is the most important one is this is the one that comes with, with any, you know, self-change happens before anything else can change. And I love the book of Proverbs because even when I was studying this, it seems like all of the verses were from the book of Proverbs. And a lot of it was about planning. Proverbs 16.3, it says, commit your, your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. 16.9, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. I love that. But the Lord directs his steps, right? That's what we should be praying for. You know, a verse that reminds me why we go to our confession fathers. It says, in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And that a lot of the times, that's our confession father sitting with us and telling him, hey, this is, this is where we need to go. And in 2 Chronicles 15, 7, but you, be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And I love that verse because it's just a reminder that is it going to be easy? I don't expect it to be easy. But will we be rewarded? Hands down. Not only will we be rewarded, you know, but it's going to be an amazing reward. So we have things to accomplish this year. You know, we've got this vision for our lives, our families, our church. We're going to kind of jump into this a little bit each week. Um, but I kind of like I was alluding to is like, but we are already, you know, almost 10% down of the year. So it, I have a feeling 2020 is going to move pretty quickly as well. And, but my, my challenge is, is let's let it end in a direction where we want it to end. And there's this great quote. I love it. I probably quote it all of the time. It says, don't worry about failing. Worry about succeeding at things that, in life that really don't matter. So that's our homework this week. Put together your spiritual rule and then think about that, guys. I, I literally, I think if we all thought about who we want to be in 10 years from now, it, it, would, it would give a lot of great insight on where we're headed. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Stand up and pray.
the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you because you've got, you've got a plan for us, God. You've created every single one of us in such a miraculous way, Lord, with such talents and gifts. And I will confess that we've gotten really good at using them for our own benefit, whether we use them at work or, or in our relationships. But Lord, I ask that, that you allow us to grow into the people that you have called us to be. That all of those great talents and, and, and gifts that you've given us, Lord, that we can direct them back towards you. Lord, just like Abuna was saying in the sermon today, Lord, with St. John the Baptist, Lord, that let us decrease so that you may increase, Lord. And let us take more of your image, Lord. I know that we all have growth plans, Lord, but I ask that you allow us to have spiritual growth plans. Open up our eyes to the areas of our life, Lord, that you want to grow us so that ultimately, Lord, that you can be glorified, that we could be happy, that we can feel your joy and your presence, Lord. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins because, Lord, we know that we have many. But, Lord, I ask that your grace just cover those sins and that you encourage us and that you call us to the bar that you set for us, which is holiness. And I know, Lord, I know that you will not forsake us. I ask that you hear these prayers lifted to the sessions of all your saints and martyrs that we pray one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Christ Jesus our Lord, by the kingdom and the power.